you all, uh, wherever you are. I'm going to speak this morning on the passage from Revelation uh, chapter 7, from verse 9. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. The book of Revelation has been much misunderstood and much neglected. Understood rightly, it forms a most fitting climax to the Christian scriptures. The writer, John, has produced a fascinating document based on his own visions and crafted into a literary masterpiece. On the one hand, it is a letter to seven churches in what today is Turkey, churches that John knows well, but intended for a wider audience. It is also a prophecy in the tradition of the prophets of the Hebrew scriptures. John uses the language of the prophets but he reinterprets their expectations because he knows that much has already been fulfilled. Jesus Christ has come to inaugurate the kingdom of God. The end times have already begun. What has this strange book, full of symbols and significant numbers, with references often obscure to us, to say to us today. It was written to help Christians in the first century AD to reflect upon their circumstances in the light of the future establishment of God's kingdom and his defeat of all that is evil. It was a time of persecution by the Roman state, which demanded that all the subjects of its empire should worship Caesar. Caesar, the name of the tyrant emperors who made themselves gods. It was written with the conviction that the worship of the true God resists the dangers of making military or political power into a god, and of making economic prosperity into a god. The symbol of military power in the book is the beast. The symbol of economic prosperity is Babylon. The beast and Babylon are code words for Rome, but there are counterparts to Rome in every period of history. I don't really need to say any more about the relevance of this book to our times. To us who watch and wait with alarm while a powerful nation invades a smaller one to oppress it with its own ideology. To us who are bombarded by messages from those whose gods our money, sex, and power, and who desire to manipulate us to their point of view, to their own gain. John writes to encourage the members of the churches with the assurance that God will inevitably, in his own time, defeat evil and establish his universal kingdom. But it is clear from some of the seven letters to the individual churches in chapters two and three that he also writes to warn and rebuke some churches that have compromised with the propaganda of the world around them and have put their members in great danger. In our passage this morning from chapter seven, from verse nine, printed on our sheets, we have a wonderful account of a vision given to John 
of worship in heaven. The episodes in this book are not all intended to be in chronological order. Visions of heaven that really belong later are placed along the way to give encouragement. The passage begins with an unforgettable picture of the full company of the saints in heaven. They are a multitude that no one can number. And they are gathered from every race and tribe and people and language. You notice that he uses four nouns there that all mean much the same thing. Race, tribe, people and language. The number four represents the whole world. People from every corner of the earth as we still say, even though we know perfectly well that it is a sphere. This is a breathtaking missionary vision from a first century Jewish Christian writer. This innumerable crowd are standing before the throne. A favorite image of John, a symbol representing God himself as the one who is ruler over all. And they are standing also before the Lamb. The Lamb is John's favorite title for Jesus. Seven is his favorite number, representing completeness. He uses the name in his book, the name Jesus, 14 times, twice times seven. He uses the title Christ seven times. But the title the Lamb comes 28 times. That is four times seven. Four standing for the world and seven for completeness. There are several possible sources for John's use of the Lamb, mostly from the Old Testament. It is enough for us to relate it this morning to the identification by John the Baptist in the first chapter of John's Gospel. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, which we use in our liturgy after the Lord's Prayer. In Revelation, Christ is the Lamb that was slain, the sacrificial Lamb, through whom forgiveness of sins is offered to all. The innumerable multitude are robed in white, which symbolizes purity and also victory and resurrection glory. They hold palm branches as a sign of victory. They have conquered in the great tribulation, but they shout out, ascribing their victory to God and the Lamb. Many scholars take these people to be the martyrs. And certainly, this is a book that expects all Christians to be ready for martyrdom, as Jesus did when he challenged us to take up our cross. And as many have to in many countries of our troubled world today, in the suffering church, they have to be prepared for martyrdom. But this great crowd is surely the whole company of the faithful at the end of time. It is not their deaths that have won the triumph, but the death of the Lamb. One commentator makes an observation that is very apt for our time. He says, for men confronted by tyrants, who put their trust in sword and bow, that final triumph comes through quiet trust in Christ. In verses 11 and 12, John depicts his vision of the heavenly host around the throne. Angels, the elders who are also angelic powers, and four living creatures representing God's creation on earth, praising God constantly. It came as a surprise to me to discover that the word archangel comes only twice in the Bible. 
both times in the New Testament, but not at all in Revelation. However, as we know from week to week, archangels have somehow found their way into our liturgy. We have to be careful here because in a normal week they come as a cue for the Sanctus. And I don't think we're singing that. We worship together with the angels and archangels and all the company of heaven singing the hymn of your unending glory. Our human worship is given up together with the worship of heaven. And this crowd do indeed give glory to God, but they also use an impressive parade of six other nouns to make up that significant number seven. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and might be to our God for ever and ever. Amen. The multitude that no one can number ascribe perfect worship to God in company with the host of heaven. There are many hymns, both older and more recent, that pick up language from passages like this in Revelation, and indeed our first hymn did this morning. In verses 13 and 14, one of the elders tries to elicit from John what he makes of the great vision. Who are these robed in white, and where have they come from? John humbly confesses ignorance and receives the explanation. These are they who have come out of the great ordeal or tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The great ordeal seems to refer to a specific trial at the end, but also to the persecution with which the early church was faced. Indeed, it can take in the whole struggle of life. To each of the seven churches named in chapters 2 and 3, Jesus promises huge rewards to those who conquer, to those who are faithful unto death. D.T. Niles, the 20th century theologian from Ceylon, commented, The Great Tribulation that certainly meant the persecution in which we were caught. But it also meant that constant tribulation of life, which was the result of evils warring against God. Out of that tribulation and because of it come the host of the redeemed. D.T. Niles seems to refer there to a specific time of persecution in Sri Lanka as we now call it, and his words are poignant in view of the continuing persecution there, and especially the horror attacks on three churches and three hotels on Easter Day three years ago. And the elder then explains the white robes. They have washed their robes, he says, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. John is fond of startling paradoxes like this. How can washing in blood make robes white? But he uses this image to describe the power of Christ's atoning blood. And the meaning of blood is cost, as we are well aware in this time of war. One commentator reflects that multitudes have had their soiled lives purified and have been assured of God's forgiveness through the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain, the one who died and is alive forevermore. And so we come to the climax of the chapter in which John takes threads from the scriptures that he knows well to weave a tapestry depicting life in heaven. He uses, in particular, passages from Isaiah and from Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is the psalm set for today, 
and we shall be singing it to the tune Brother James's Heir. For this reason, says the elder, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple, and the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. Literally, God will make his dwelling upon them. The same word is used in John chapter 1 of Jesus. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Son dwelt among us for the span of his life, but in eternity God will dwell with us and protect us forever. Verse 16 assures us that the life of heaven will be without pain, with no unsatisfied desire. We shall not suffer the pangs of hunger or thirst. We shall not suffer from the sun or any scorching heat. Pain as we know it from day to day will be a thing of the past. In our Sunday school, many years ago, we loved to choose the chorus, I'm feeding on the living bread. We chose that, I think, because of its repetitions of what, never thirst again? And no, never thirst again. That was sung antiphonally, although I'm sure we didn't know that word. It was sung antiphonally with the girls. What, never thirst again? No, never thirst again. It was much later that I realized that though we come to Christ the satisfier and decide to follow him once and for all, there is a sense in which we continue to thirst after Christ. And we need to come to him regularly in worship, both privately and together, to assuage that thirst. And even after death, we shall continue to thirst after God. But that thirst will be constantly satisfied. This is what we are assured in our final verse, where John brings together Psalm 23 and Isaiah 49. He writes, The lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. Literally, will shepherd them. That is another startling paradox. The lamb suddenly becomes the shepherd. And then John uses another word from Psalm 23. He will guide them to springs of living water, literally springs of the water of life. Abundant running water, safe drinking water upon which life depends, ever flowing water to sustain the life of eternity. We cannot get lost in heaven, but we shall be protected and guided. All our deepest needs will be provided for, all our aspirations fulfilled. And finally, we have that lovely image which John takes straight from Isaiah. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. God, the Almighty One, is pictured as a parent wiping away a tear from a child's cheek. In this world, crying helps us to face disappointment or grief, and we regard it as a good safety valve. In the future life, it will be unnecessary. Well, this is only one vision of heaven in the Bible. Other passages give us other insights. Here, as Paul says, we can know only in part, but then face to face. But from this exalted passage, we are overwhelmed by the wonder of the whole countless host giving glory to God for salvation. We shall be delivered from every ill, we shall be in God's nearer presence, his tender, shepherd-like concern will make complete provision for our every need. 
Let us pray. Lord, with gratitude, we remember all who have gone before us in the way of Christ. The apostles who first obeyed the call to discipleship, the martyrs who gave their lives for the faith they professed, the men and women of prayer, the saints whose lives bore evidence of your love in our midst, the scholars who have helped us to understand our faith, evangelists, leaders, and all holy men and women. We remember too, O Lord, those whom we have loved and known, who in their lives walked in the faith of Christ and died in the sure and certain hope of the life to come. For all those who live with you, and serve you in your everlasting kingdom. We offer our praise and thanksgiving. Living Lord of life and death, King of all the earth, God from everlasting to everlasting. Amen.